Welcome to another episode of Hired, where we chat with amazing leaders about their unconventional journey to success. From the highs to the lows and everything in between, these stories are a testament to the power of resilience, determination, and a little bit of luck. I'm your host, Mike Thompson, and on today's show, we welcome Monica Poole-Knox, Chief People Officer at Domo. We'll chat with Monica about her childhood fearlessly chasing alligator lizards, the pressures around gender norms and racism in the workplace, overcoming heartbreak and loss, and how discomfort drove her to take risks and make bold choices in her career. Without further ado, let's jump in with Monica. Okay, Monica, we're live. Not live, we're recording. So let's take it back to the beginning, childhood. Paint wow. me a picture of what it was like growing up. What did the house look like? Siblings? What did mom and dad do? Paint me a picture of childhood for you. Yeah. Childhood for me was, you know, when I think of my childhood, is it happy memories. I, uh, I grew up in, I was born in Germany, and I grew up in Northern California, so I spent you know, my early years in Monterey, we, we left Germany when I was still very little. I don't remember it. My brother does, but I, I don't remember it. Um, so, you know, lived in Monterey, beautiful part of the, the, the state. And then we moved um, to San Francisco and lived in the Presidio when it was still a military base. My father was, uh, he retired a, a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. And so my whole life was, uh, was military. We were a military family. So um, it was kind of funny because, you know, my dad, you know, he had this like big job and he'd come home and he'd like want to command, you know, you will do this and you will do that. And we were just like, we're not doing that. You know, the kids, <laughs> and he goes, I have no respect. I have respect everywhere, but in my own home. And my mom would just laugh, you know. Um, but very happy memories. I have uh, an older brother, two years older. And so I grew up doing everything he did. Cause mm -hmm. what do you do when you're the younger sibling? You kind of model yourself after your older sibling. I mean, we couldn't be more different. You know, he's an engineer. He's very cautious. He's, you know, by the way, he always got like straight A's in school and didn't even have to study. I studied really hard, you know, <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'd still make B's sometimes, you know, I remember I made, you know, a couple C's and I was just like, ah, you know, so my brother was always very, you know, just, just really bright. And so it pushed me to, um, you know, do really well in school. Um, so following after him, what did I do? You know, besides the academic part, I was out climbing trees and, catching frogs and lizards. And um, we used to catch these lizards in Monterey. I remember they were uh, alligator lizards. They were huge lizards. I think about it now. And of course, if you'd see them, they'd be like a frightening. But, you know, as a kid, you have to learn to fear things. Jeez. And we didn't fear. It was like, I got an alligator lizard. The bigger, the better. And these things were like, you know, pretty long. <laughs> and what how, would, how would you catch them? How would you catch these we alligators? Would, we would catch them by our hands. And of course, they'd bite us. And that was also a badge of honor. I got bit by the alligator lizard, you know, and I survived. And so we would put them in the, this jar and we put punch, punch holes in it like a mayonnaise jar, an empty one, and, you know, to let them breathe. And then we'd give them lettuce. And then the sad thing was like, we would see how long they would live. Cause you know, eventually they die. But you know, as a kid, you're just like, wow, mine lived for, you know, two weeks or whatever the case might be. So, you know, that's how I grew up. And so I was very much maybe what you'd consider a tomboy. You know, I did, my brother was a sports kid. So I played sports with him and I mean, you know, I, I played like baseball. Mm. <laughs> I played football, you know what I mean? And basketball ended up being my jam. You know, that was my thing. Um, which was perfectly normal for me. And I'm just really glad at the time that my mother just allowed me to explore the things that I was interested mm -hmm. in and didn't tell me like, well, girls shouldn't play baseball or girls can't climb trees or that, you know what I mean? I was never put any limits on what I could or should do. Uh, and so I remember the first time when my parents made some decisions that reflected the different genders that we were, because I didn't think about that either. I was just like, hey, yeah, I'm a girl. He's a boy, but so what? I was like, I think it was about 15. And they let him do something. I think it was 
go out or stay out later or something that they didn't let me do. Hmm. And it wasn't an age thing because he was two years older than me, but it was something about gender. And I remember that conversation of like, well, no, no, you're a girl. And I was like, what does that have to do anything? <laughs> you know, so I, it was really later in life that there was any distinguishing between me and my brother. And I think that shaped just the way I saw myself and other people, people are people and people have different interests and capabilities and whatever gender they are or whatever experiences they have is just their own experience. Like there's no good or bad or should or shouldn't. And I, where do you think, where parents. do you think that came from, from your parents? Cause like, that's a, you know, a pretty progressive way of, of parenting, yeah. you know, and not, not it being uh, any gender until 15. Like, where do you think that came from? Was that something they did like consciously purposely or was it how they grew up or how do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, we even used to dress alike. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was just so ingrained in everything that we did. Um, but I think it's probably my mother, because she grew up in an era where, you know, um, she was taught she she's a classically trained pianist. She's she's like won all kind of state competitions. Wow. Um, and she grew up just in this environment of girls do this, boys do that. Girls do ballet, boys do sports. And what I didn't know is during the time that I was growing up, my grandmother would say to my mother, why are you letting her do all those sports? She's going to get big muscles and she's going to look like, you know, and she would criticize my mom. And my mom was like, no, um, this is what she wants to do. And um, I'm not going to tell her she can't because of her gender. So I think that was very intentional um, by my mother, because when she grew up, she was actually kind of pushed to do things that maybe like she didn't want to play piano, but she was forced because girl, little girls did that. Um, and of course now she appreciates that she knows how to play, but it wasn't for many, many years right. because of the way it was introduced to her. So I do think it came from my mother's experience, not being kind of, you know, she, the experience that I had and, and being very intentional and, and making sure that it was a bit different than how she grew up. Very, very cool. And, and, you know, your brother, a couple of years older, sounds like, you know, he was athletic straight A's. Did mm -hmm. you feel pressure to like be good student because he was a good student or play sports because he was, or how was the dynamic with, with him being a little bit older and kind of being that, that straight A athletic student and you looking up to him? Yeah. The good thing is I didn't feel pressure. If, if there was any pressure, I put pressure on myself, mm. you know, and, and I never felt like my parents saying, well, you got to be like, you know, your older brother. Now what I did feel was pressure to, be strong academically because my mother was a teacher. And when you grow up in the home of a teacher, education is really important. And so, you know, I learned early on that the expectation was that you excelled academically. And it wasn't just my mother. My, my grandmother was a teacher. My great grandmother was a teacher. And, you know, my uncles and um, academia at, you know, a major um, university, I just had it all around me. And so that probably came more from my my mother. Um, and then my father was, you know, he was, like I said, he was, you know, uh, he was just this guy that was like, like, I remember, let me just tell you a story and tell you my mom. I love it. Um, when I moved to North, when we moved, so I, as I shared with you, we lived in the Presidio of San Francisco and then we moved North. We moved up to Marin County. And by the way, I'm, I'm a very strong affinity for where I grew up. Um, I love Marin County and um, it's just such a beautiful place. And I'd encourage anyone to raise their kids there. But I have to admit, when I grew up in like, you know, the time, era 70s that I grew up in, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me at my school. I remember going to the, my elementary school and um, people, you know, kids don't know what they know. They, you know, they, they, they just respond and they respond to what they've been exposed to based on television, maybe their family or friends or whatever. And I remember showing up at the school and I was called the N word pretty repeatedly. And I didn't even know what it meant. I had to ask my parents because I hadn't heard that before. And um, when I learned it was negative, I started fighting. So I started beating it. And these were mostly guys. So funny because I grew up with these kids and we like went to high school together and like, you know, you know, but early on they were just kids who were like, uh, you know, here I was like seven, eight years old and they're, they're calling me these racial slurs. And 
I didn't even understand them. And, but once I did, I was like, oh, this isn't good. And so I don't like you calling me this. And so I'm going to stop you from calling me this. And I just beat them up. <laughs> I just beat the kids up. And I'd come home from school with these ripped dresses. And, you know, my mom was like, oh, my God, what happened to your dress? Or, you know, you're all like messed up, your hair, your dresses, everything's bloody, you know. And I was like, oh, I just, you know, fell. I was climbing over a fence. I'd always tell her it was something other than what happened. But I would tell my dad what happened. And he'd be like, good. Did you did you get him? Did you hit him good? You know, and he'd be like, you go back to school and you beat him up again. You know, <laughs> like he was just that kind of probably bad parenting. But I was like, OK. But, you know, I shared that story. Um, it was, I know I shared, you know, about the, the racial story. It was really about my dad and, and the way that he thought about things. He was a warrior. I knew he loved me deeply. And, um, you know, he was also, he really loved sports. And so it was kind of cool for me to pursue the sports side of it. Cause it was another um, point of connection with, with me and my dad. And he was another one that never said, Oh, well, you can't play basketball or you can't play baseball because you're a girl. Um, so, so yeah, those, those were some of my early influences. It sounds like from foundationally, it was like a, a competitive nature, but also the ability to stand up for yourself and, and have confidence in that. Like at, at that age, like that's a, that's the reaction you had is rare. Like normally it's not to push back. It's to, you know, so like early on building that foundation of confidence and, and, you know, kind of you know, self-confidence and, and things is, is huge. And that probably set you up. Like, as you look back on that, that experience, like served you very well in your career going forward is that, that foundational piece that you kind of grew up with. Yeah. I hadn't really thought of it that way. Um, but I, I, I suppose so, you know, we're so moldable when we're young yeah. uh -huh. and we just, we're like sponges. We just learn things. And so, you know, you know, you have someone like your dad who, you know, you adore as your hero telling you like, yeah, go beat him up again. You're like, yeah. And they don't say, you know, uh, you might lose. They don't say, they just say, yeah, go do it. And you're like, mm -hmm. okay. And you don't think that you can't because nobody gave you that impression. And so I agree. I think those earlier years, um, you know, and I hadn't, again, hadn't made that connection, certainly did set the foundation for, you know, many other things. And I think, again, I think as you grow up, and you have successes that builds confidence too, but it does help when you have somebody that you trust encouraging you to, to go and be and not give you this idea that perhaps you might fail. Yeah. And also being at the young age you were with your parents kind of not conforming to, and in, the, in this case it was gender roles, but like, if you want to do something, you could do it. You could do anything. Like don't let somebody tell you what you have to do. If you want to yeah. do it, go do it. And like, as a kid, young, that's extremely powerful. Like you were unbound. And if you wanted to go play sports, catch alligator lizards, whatever it may be, yeah. like you were going to go and do it. Yeah. Yeah. I never felt any limits. It never occurred to me that there were any limits. Huh. And again, I don't, I, in the moment, I, you know, you're just growing up, you're just living your life. And I think, you know, it's really when you look back and you also learn of the different ways other people were raised and you start to get the perspective of how it could have gone. Right. And so, you know, as I look back, I do, and I've thanked my mom, you know, we, I tell you, as I grew up and got older into my, you know, teenage years, um, we fought a lot. <laughs> and I think for people that have, you know, uh, older um, children in the home, um, you know, especially if you're a mom, and I think if you're a dad, you know, I think you've got the same genders and there's kind of this, um, evolution that happens, like you get to be this young woman, and then you're kind of, like, I don't know, and odds with your mom. And so there's like two women in the house kind of thing, or two men in the house, and you're still super young, you don't know anything. But I think what can happen is the sense of wanting to be independent. And then, you know, there, there's that kind of stripping away as you get older, and you find your yourself. And I think for me, um, I was always in battle with my mom, just when I was like 16, I got to be 17. And certainly right before I left for college, we were just always fighting about things. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if any, uh, any of the listeners can relate to that. But I have come back and thanked her <laughs> for the way she raised me. And, uh, you know, I have such an appreciation for what she did in so many ways. And uh, I know, I know she appreciates that because those, you know, we're, we're 
tough, tough parental times, um, for, certainly for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but she always said like, oh, I can't wait till you get yours, you know? <laughs> and now I know what she's talking about because I have a 16 year old and boy, oh boy, he's a handful. Um, and, uh, you know, but it's really that kind of process of maturing and kind of coming into your own that I think that he's experiencing. Because when I talk to his, you know, the parents of his friends, they're, they're all, we're all going through it together. So she was right. Again, mom's always right. Uh, but I so appreciate her. So when you were, you know, getting that sense of independence around 16, 17, what did you think you were going to do for a living? Like, did you look up to and want to be like, did you have any direction at that point in terms of, you know, I like school, I'd like to be a teacher if, if that was kind of in your, or, you know, did you want to be, did you have any inklings of what you were going to do for a living? Yeah, absolutely none. None? Absolutely none. <laughs> I, I, I was interested in a lot of things, you know, I mean, I was, uh, you know, in high school, I was in student government, so I had run for office and I was doing stuff for the school, you know, and that was, that was fun. Um, so I liked leadership. I, I was a cheerleader. I was our head cheerleader. So I was always calling the plays and we were doing stuff like competitions. And as I shared with you, I was a basketball player and, um, you know, our, I, I remember our senior year, we, we came in number two in the, in the, in the county. I mean, we were, we were always like pretty bad. <laughs> our basketball team was always, our, our women's basketball team was always pretty bad at the time when I was growing up. And, you know, we, we, uh, we came in number two to, to another high school that was traditionally like really good, which was pretty accomplished, an accomplishment, right? So this, this competitive spirit and just, you know, driving to be good at whatever I was doing and leadership was always part of kind of, you know, what I tend to gravitate, I gravitated to. Um, but I had no idea how to translate that into, you know, a career, not, nothing. And I, I, I didn't worry about it. I, I think for me, it was always just following the thing I enjoyed. Um, I remember at one time I considered, well, maybe I could be, um, like a professional cheerleader <laughs> because I would go to these camps and these, and, and the camp instructors were so good. They're very young. You know, a lot of them were, you know, either just, you know, early college. Um, but I, I loved, I loved that the dancing, the cheerleading and, and the camaraderie of the team and the competitions and all of that. But, you know, I was like, yeah, I don't think I can make a living off of that. And I had a lot of different interests. Um, so I went to undergrad, I went to UC Santa Barbara, and um, I started out undeclared, but um, actually I started out in uh, the econ major, which was a disaster. I, I was trying to follow my, I, I, what was I trying to do? I know what I was trying to do. I Initially, I started out with a curriculum very similar to engineers because my brother, who'd gone on to UC Davis, was an engineering major. And so I'm like, what are you taking? And he's like, I'm taking these classes. I was like, okay, I'm going to take those too. And that was like a disaster. I was like, this is like whatever, you know, calculus three. I was like, what are they talking about? You know, so um, I was quickly, you know, reminded that we have different skill sets and really had to kind of start my own path a a along that in, in, in undergrad. Um, and I just was taking classes I was interested in. Of course, I had to get the journal ed out of the way. I thought I might be a psychology major because I did really well in my psychology classes. But one of my girlfriends was majoring in communications and she loved it. So I was like, okay, let me take some classes. And I loved it. Hmm. I had no idea what I was going to do with it, but it was just something I enjoyed. So for me, it was always the pursuit of what gave me joy and passion. And, you know, had I done my research, I would have seen coming out of undergrad, you know, communications majors weren't, you know, <laughs> making this great living, you know, uh, like right out of college. Um, but uh, I always had an interest in business. And but to your question, I never wanted to be a teacher. I was like, oh, that's what my mother does. Like, I'm not doing that. And so I was like, I don't know, maybe I could have pursued that and, and enjoyed it. But I was going to make sure I didn't do that because that was kind of my, my, my lineage, so to speak. And, 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 and it's interesting because like one thing I'm, I'm learning about you through your story is there's a thread of, of you did a lot of different things. You were, were interested in doing something and you did it, right? Like no matter if it was a sport or running for office in high school or cheerleading or whatever it may be, you just did it. Schools and, and, and kind of classes in, in college was the same. It probably wouldn't have been the same experience if you said, 
business is what's going to get me the, the logical choice, the right job. So I'm going to take classes that do this. You wouldn't have followed passions and leaned into things that you liked as much. And it would almost be a deviation from what you had done up to that point in your life. Yeah. I mean, probably the theme is, you know, you may be, you know, kind of picking up. I, I, uh, you know, I, I was really about being authentic to what I wanted to do and who I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, an engineer is going to make a lot of money coming out of school and can support themselves. Uh, and by the way, part of this was, I didn't want to move back in with my parents because <laughs> I told you we were fighting and I was like, okay, how do I make sure I don't have to do that? Um, but then also the, the leader uh, of these decisions for, in my heart was about being authentic to what I could do and do well and, and really enjoy. And yeah, if I can make a living off of it, great, you know? And so um, that, that is really kind of the, the path that, that I, that I was following. Hmm. Um, and some of that was just trial and error. Like, huh, oh, this isn't, I don't like this class. I don't like calculus three, or I don't even know if there is a calculus three. And there might as well have been for me, it could have been calculus one introductory, but it was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is the, the hardest class I've ever had. Um, and, you know, I did okay in it. It's just, just the energy and the effort that it took me to do okay in the class was like, mm, I'm not, this is not where I'm finding joy. So just the things, knowing, knowing the things that I didn't connect with was really helpful in me kind of finding my way. Um, when I finished undergrad, I, uh, you know, by this time I was pretty, I loved business. I just, mm. I don't know, I loved business. I just loved coming up with ideas and um, the sales process and like being successful in business. In fact, my grandfather was, uh, you know, a, a businessman. And so um, I decided to go to get my MBA and I, I just decided I was going to do that. <laughs> like right after, right after your, yeah. you, right after undergrad, you were like, right I'm going right into leaning into MBA right yep. from, from that. Wow. And again, nobody said, well, you shouldn't do that. You should work two years before four to two to four years, which, you know, there's, 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 there's a good reason why MBAs, uh, MBA programs want you to work because you bring more to the classroom. Um, but that was not what I was going to do. And mm -hmm. I was just going to go straight through and like, nobody told me, well, that's really hard to do. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So your, your classmates were probably all professionals, much probably older, brought in some, some industry experience. And now you're in the MBA program. You're in a group with these individuals contributing but I'm sure knowing your story, you had confidence and you were betting on yourself that you could do it and you didn't retract away. You probably leaned into that more and it probably motivated you as a competitive person you were that you wanted to kind of make sure that you could compete at that level. Yeah. I wish that were the story, but I actually went into the NBA scared to death. I mean, I got admitted to University of Texas. It was number 11. I mean, I did want to go to a top NBA school. And I was like, oh, my God, if I could get my MBA, like, that would be the biggest accomplishment ever. And I went mm. to this amazing school um, and I went there uh, super nervous because I felt like, you know, I'm like, OK, I'm, I'm with like such amazing students here and have had this incredible experiences. And I just, I, you know, I, I got to. I got to step it up and right. I, I, hope I can do that. You know, I, I so I, I did, I didn't go in with this ton of confidence, but I went in um, maybe swinging a little bit because I was like, okay, I don't have all these things. Although I had worked. So for example, you know, UC Santa Barbara, I always worked and um, I, uh, I worked in the office of financial aid, like the last couple of years mm -hmm. of, of school. And I did that part time, but there were some people who worked as financial aid counselors full time. Now, obviously, they were more skilled than I was, but I learned a lot from them. And um, I mean, what a great job, right? Office of Financial Aid for your student. Um, I can't even tell you that I was smart enough to know that that was actually a pretty wise choice as a student. Um, but it was super helpful because I was able to navigate and learn, you know, how to get the, the financial aid um, hmm. that I needed. And so I had a lot of experience, work experience, but it was more part-time. I guess if you added up and the leadership. So if you added it up, I did have, you know, some experiences to, to contribute, but um, it's so funny because when I went to school, I didn't really talk about, you know, how old I was or the experiences, the work experiences that I had, you know, we we're just in classes together. And, and it wasn't until like second year where people started to learn that I 
went straight through and they're like, wow, we thought you were older. Uh, you know, if they had said that now, I might have might have been offended. You know? <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, at the time, I felt like that was a good compliment. Um, so, yeah, that was just and then, you know, you get there and you just dive in and then you find yourself just kind of swimming with the fishes and you're just all in there together and you stop thinking about like, oh, you know, should I be here or could I cut it? Just go, just go. Did you think going into the MBA, you were interested in business? Did you have any idea about what you would want to do as a career and a profession? Or did you want to use the MBA to kind of explore different areas of business and that you would figure it out? Or, or where were you at in terms of what you thought you would do pre-MBA? I had no idea. Hmm. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I went in, I was like, well, I guess I'll figure it out. You know, I don't know what I want to do. And but I love business. And so again, it was through the classes. I did really good in OB, my organizational behavior mm. classes. I actually did really good in accounting. And I don't know what that says about me, but like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not like an accountant personality, although maybe there isn't one. I don't know. Maybe that's the learning. I don't know why I did, did well in that. I loved economics, but I just didn't do as well in economics as in mm. some of the other classes. And so, you know, again, through that process of taking these different courses, um, it really led me into this kind of field of HR. And uh, I remember I was, uh, this was like towards the end of my first year, still not sure what I wanted to do, knowing which classes I enjoyed, but not really knowing how that translated into a uh, particular career in business. And, um, you know, a lot of my friends were like, yeah, I'm marketing or I'm operations, you know, and, and there wasn't an HR concentration. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you could, you could concentrate on like general management. Um, but, the, but, you know, I know now there are a number of MBA programs that have HR concentrations. Um, at the time my school didn't have that, but I remember going to an information session, which a lot of us went to, we heard industry, you know, professionals come in and talk about what they, what they did. That was very common. Like every week there was something, a panel, you know, talking, someone talking from different companies. And I went to this particular one and I remember this woman, she was from bank of America and I see her face right now. I wish I could remember her name, but she was talking about what she did as an HR professional. And I just like connected with that so much. I was mm. like, oh my gosh, you know, that's what I want to do. I love the fluidity in which HR professionals could work. Like you can work, you know, with entry level folks all the way up to, you know, CEO. I mean, you just kind of flow within um, the impact you could make through talent. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And it was I, you know, look, everybody's super clear, like, yeah, you know, driving revenues, you know, but for me, the, the, the talent impact was a little more obscure. It was like mm. maybe the secret magic sauce to companies. And I like that, you know, kind of being able to drive impact in a maybe, I don't know, more of a low key way. Um, and then more being, artistic way. It's less science. It's creative more, way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, it was just something that appealed the unstructuredness of it probably mm. appealed to me. Um, Cause I do really well. I love the white space and I love creating in the white space. Mm. And I felt like there was lots of opportunity to do that. You know, humans don't have formulas. Um, you know, if you, my brothers and engineers, you put in certain, you know, like numerical, data points, you're going to get a certain outcome. Like it's that, you know, there's certainty in math. There was no certainty in this space of human um, growth and development. And I thought that was super interesting. So that's, that's why. So that it. info session was like your light bulb moment where you were like this, like this is combining business versus kind of unstructured creative thinking that I want to do. HR is what I want to get into. What happened next? And this was in first year, right? So yeah. Did you start thinking about where you wanted to work or exploring that further or, or where did it go from that moment as you finished your MBA? Yeah. Well, at the time, telecom was hot. I mean, my yeah. gosh, it's mobile communications, the internet, there's just like, it was super, super hot space. And I, so I knew I wanted to go into telecommunications. I decided to do my internship with Bell Atlantic and um, in HR and I had an amazing experience there. It was just, just so wonderful. Um, you know, I learned a lot. I contributed, you know, a lot for the summer I was there. And I just really enjoyed it. And so um, after that internship, I was like, yeah, definitely HR is kind of the direction I want to go. And so when I finished um, my MBA program, uh, 
And there was a room, this one recruiter, she was on campus regularly from this company called GTE. That's now Verizon. Talk about that in a minute, but she was such a good recruiter. Like by the time I graduated, we knew each other. She knew all the kids, you know, and that's what it, she was a great university recruiter. Like right? that's what you do. By the time you graduate, she's like, no, she knew you were graduating. She knew who you were. And so there's this familiarity. And there were a lot of recruiters that actually came on campus. And so, you know, there, she wasn't the only one, but she was in telecom GTE. And she says, Monica, aren't you graduating this year? I was like, yeah, she's sent me a resume. And so I sent her my resume and all of a sudden I got this call to interview for GTE's um, associate development program, uh, which they, they still have. It's, it's at Verizon. And um, I went in and, and I thought, this is a great experience because if I get, you know, this kind of opportunity, it allowed me to do three, six month assignments and I can rotate and I can learn a lot about the HR function because actually by this time I had decided to major in marketing. Oh. I knew I wanted to go to HR, but it's like, let me major in marketing. That way I'll have a broader set of skills mm. and uh, I can take some of my marketing experiences and apply it to HR. Very cool. So, so that's what I did. And so when I, you know, got the job at GTE and I did my three, six month assignments, um, it really gave me a wonderful foundation of, of the HR function at like a top tier company. Now GTE eventually merged with Bell Atlantic and became what we know as Verizon. Um, so a lot of people may not remember GT unless you, you know, you lived in, in, in that local market, but uh, GTE, uh, phenomenal company, um, now Verizon, and it was just, you know, a great place to, to, to grow up professionally. I was there for 11 years. Wow. Now, was there an opportunity? I mean, you did your internship with Bell. Was there an opportunity to work for them full time coming out? Did you have multiple options? And, and why yeah. ultimately did you pick GT? Was it the recruiter influence? Was it who, how you who you interviewed with? Or like, how did you decide there and what other ones were you evaluating at that time? Yeah. Well, I, I thought I was going to go back to Bell Atlantic. In fact, that was the plan. I was like, oh, I love this internship. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back. And then as businesses go, reorg. It was just the timing. There's this massive sure. reorg. It kind of, you know, it was hitting around the time that I was, you know, kind of making some of those decisions. Um, you know, it's kind of funny now that I think about it when, when, you know, in past companies, when we've had internships, oftentimes we're giving interns offers before they leave their internship. Right. Yeah. We, we were, they weren't doing that at the time. Mm. And I remember a friend of mine, she got an offer in December, um, her second year MBA. And she was like, I don't want to take it because if I take it, then I'll, you know, I don't know if I want to work at this company. There may be many other companies that I'll had exposure to that I want to work. And so she had this kind of challenge with accepting an offer in December because it was so early. So, you know, the timing with time was a little bit different with that. So, you know, for me, although I had had my internship, you know, I didn't have an offer. I don't know if I would have, would I have taken it at the time? I, I don't know, but um, that's not just at that time that, that wasn't as common. So it was really kind of in the spring where we were doing kind of more of the final interviews. And I, and I, you know, kind of got to this point after multiple conversations with them, they're like, oh, we'd love to bring you on, but we're restructuring. We kind of don't know what the roles are going to be. The, these departments are changing. And uh, I kind of decided at a certain point, like, uh, I'm not going to wait because if I just wait for them, I may miss other opportunities. And right. so decided to, you know, interview with other companies, but I was still very much interested in telecom. So yeah, I considered others in healthcare and CPG consulting. I considered all those. What was it about telco other than obviously that it was exploding at that time? Was that just where it stopped? It was like this industry's blowing up. This will be a great first job for me to get into this industry that's growing and create opportunities. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was the dynamic nature of telecom. Um, which probably explains why I'm in, I'm in digital tech now, right? Yeah. Because it was always changing. It was something new. We were, you know, it was just growing. The international piece was interesting. Like it was just very dynamic. And I felt like in those environments uh, that were continuing to expand that I could continue to, to expand as well. I could continue to grow and learn. So that, that's why, um, and it wasn't the only one, but it was at that time, it was pretty hot. Hmm. So you spent 11 years 
Mm -hmm. with Verizon. And I'm sure there are countless stories and memories over those 11 years. And I want to get into what your decision was to leave. But before we get to that, what was one or two moments that you can trace to that experience that were critical to shaping you as a professional, as a leader? Were there any projects, any managers you had, any scenarios that you can point to to say, these ones stick out for whatever reason? Oh, my gosh. I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. No, there's so many. Um, 11 years is a long time. There's a lot of stories, a lot of projects, a lot of people that come in and out of you know your life at that time. So it's hard to think of a, a, a few. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question. One of the things I do remember is um, I had, I got into a point where I was super interested in doing an international assignment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'd been there for, you know, I don't know, eight or nine years. And I was like, God, I want, you know, as again, for me, it was always about learning and growing. And I felt like that was, there was more for me to learn doing international HR. And so I kind of set that as an intention, um, but kind of didn't really know how to maneuver my way into Mm -hmm. international because it was like a separate division. Um, What is interesting is when I went through the interview process for the rotational program, I interviewed with a man um, by the name of Randy McDonald. Um, And we, in the interview, had this very authentic conversation um, about, you know, being a woman in a technology field, uh, being an African-American. And we just, you know, I kind of just went there with him because he seemed very authentic and very, very open. And as I look back, I was like, wow, (laughs) that's pretty real. Um, And we just had this great conversation. And I, you know, again, I was, hadn't even graduated from my MBA program. Um, and here I was having this pretty deep conversation with this very senior executive at, at, uh, you know, Verizon. And so, um, he kind of tracked me really, you know, and I remember when I joined the company, I was like, Oh, I want to work in Randy's office. And they're like, well, you probably shouldn't because it will be your first assignment. You're going to be learning. And, you know, you want to make sure in your first assignment, you just have all the runway to make the mistakes that you're going to make. And, you know, it's just kind of normal. Like you're just, you're, you, you, you want to don't, don't do your first assignment, like in the heated spotlight, you know, cause he was very senior. And I was like, Oh, I, was, I hadn't thought about that, but I felt like that was good advice. So I took that advice and I didn't do an assignment with him. And I did, you know, you know, assignments elsewhere, but he was tracking me. He was mm. tracking me through, through, um, throughout my career. And, um, I, I, I worked on an, an initiative that was really important to him that ended up going really, really well. And I remember, uh, my manager at the time said, you know, Randy's been asking about you and what you want to do because he want to make, wants to make sure you're continuing to learn and grow. I mean, a lot of the folks that went through that rotational program had left the company to pursue other things. They they got recruited out quite a bit. We got this great, these great experiences. Um, And so it was a a way of really staying connected with some of the folks that had gone through this, this program. And, and it was just, someone came to me and asked me and I was just like, Oh, I really want to do international. And literally like, it was just, I don't know, a couple months later, I was on a plane going to Puerto Rico. We had just bought Puerto Rico Telephone Company. And um, we were kind of horizonizing it, if you will. And of course, everybody wanted that international assignment, right? And you know, Puerto Rico is kind of one of those interesting places because it's a U.S. Commonwealth. It's not, it's, it's not in the mainland, um, but it's U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's kind of close, but you know, a, a distant enough. And it's culturally very different. It's, it's a Latin American place. And so the Spanish is spoken, the culture is, you know, Puerto Rican, and it's, it's a very different place. And so I, I was, uh, you know, people would say, like, how did you get, you know, like, people would say to me, like, I'm from Venezuela, or I'm from a Latin American country, and I can't, couldn't get over there. Uh, and it, would, it was really, you know, from this kind of early on, relationship that I built with a person who, by the way, ended up becoming the head of HR for Verizon. Mm. (laughs) You know, and and, and the story there is like, you just kind of never know when you're going to reconnect with people again. And so um, I'm just, when I look back, um, 
I'm, I'm thankful that I, that I had that kind of engagement with him mm -hmm. that perhaps he found refreshing. And, and so we were able to stay kind of connected through and years later um, it, you know, he, he was really a, a mentor for me and a sponsor that enabled me to have one of the most exciting professional assignments of my career. And so you just kind of never know where you're going to see, you know, people again and under what circumstances. Um, but I, again, I think the catalyst was being just very authentic and being very real with him around an experience that, you know, he wasn't as familiar with that made him feel a connection with me. And I felt a connection with him. And I appreciate that he allowed for an environment where we could have that kind of conversation. And then years later, um, you know, here I was going to this incredible place. Did you know at that time when, when you, you know, you get the assignment, of, uh, you know, in Puerto Rico, that you being authentic to yourself was a superpower almost in the sense where you, and it, and it happened earlier in a story you were, you were talking about, you know, kind of growing up and things that way, where you're just true to yourself and you just trusted in instincts in terms of what you were going to do. And this was an example of that. Like you were being yeah. authentic to yourself. You found in the moment that you felt comfortable enough to be vulnerable to share something. And it was actually something that, that served you very well and, and gave you that sense of confidence. Did you know at that time that that was something or is it just looking back where you're like oh like that was a a powerful thing that i was able to do that served me through the my career yeah it definitely is looking back because quite frankly in the moment it could have been terrifying like okay should we be even having this conversation right because i will also tell you that hasn't served me well sometimes when you are you know more direct or just you know and again, it all depends on the other person, mm -hmm. um, you know, for him and he was a New Yorker and, you know, um, just an incredible person. He went on to become the head of HR for IBM and um, unfortunately, um, you know, is now deceased. Um, and that's, that's another very sad story. But like he just, you know, he's just in created an environment where that we could have that type of engagement. But I will tell you that not everybody appreciates that kind of engagement. Right. So, you know, I think maybe it says more about the person um, than maybe about me because in other instances um, where I've had these types of conversations, uh, it's perceived very differently. Hmm. Now, yeah. did you learn from him that skill set of creating environment where the other person can be, vulnerable and authentic like was that a learning for you as a leader that you took forward in your career that i want people to feel as comfortable in being themselves to me as i felt being to him in that moment like that yeah. that was a very powerful kind of learning moment yeah for sure and and it was definitely again a look back yeah versus in the moment because you don't in the moment you don't really realize what's happening you're just in the moment but definitely as i look back and i you know, and I've thought about over the years, what kind of leader I want to be. And I would say some of the leaders that haven't been the greatest of leaders have taught me a lot as well as those like Randy. So I would absolutely say, you know, uh, yes to your question. And, and, and there's probably been many others that have helped to shape that as well. How did you define or understand growth or when you're in an environment to know, okay, it's time to move. Like I can't get growth here that I'm looking for. I need to kind of look externally for that. Was there, did it change based on the environment or were there certain checks and balances you did internally to, to kind of self-assess? For me, I always look for assignments where I can contribute, you know, I can drive impact, but then where I'm uncomfortable, hmm. those places where I'm uncomfortable are my growth opportunities. And if I feel too comfortable, that's not very fun for me. I love getting out of bed with the challenge of like, I'm just not sure how I'm going to do this. <laughs> that's a driver for me, right? Going back to my MBA program where I told you I kind of went in terrified. That was a huge driver for me to like conquer that fear and conquer that anxiousness about joining such an elite MBA program. Um, there's something in my psyche about being able to... Um, not know how to do something mm -hmm. that's that that is motivating for me and now 
it can't be so out of far of my comfort zone, like calculus that like that wasn't exciting, but there are things within kind of my wheelhouse of things that like, I really want to learn how to do and I want to learn how to do them better. Um, I'll give you a very non a non-professional example. These but are the best ones. <laughs> when I was in Puerto Rico, um, I, the, the company had some tickets to this salsa competition and it was this international competition. People were coming in from like Tokyo and Italy and all over the world to compete in this salsa competition. And so it was a company event. It, I went with my colleagues and I was sitting there watching this amazing salsa competition. These dancers were incredible. Um, and then after the show, they had just open freestyle, like, you know, it was like, yay, we had the show. Yay. Yay. There was a winner. I don't even remember who it was. And then afterwards, all the dancers like came off the stage. They opened up, you know, this dancing area, massive dancing area. And it was just freestyle and it was drinks and it was just like, yay, let's celebrate the winners. And some of the, you know, the dancers came out of their costumes and put on jeans and just, you know, and the freestyle dancing was incredible, <laughs> much less the show. And I was watching them do all the stuff, the, the turls, the swirls, the spins, the dips, and the movement. And remember, I remember I had kind of been in cheerleading and dancing and appreciated all that. And I love the salsa, salsa music. And I said, I'm going to learn how to do that. <laughs> and over the years, I took lessons and... Um, you know, certainly stepped on a lot of toes and um, did things the wrong way. And I mean, all kinds, you know, dips of f fell on the floor, you know, and all kinds of stuff. But I got to that level where I could, you know, go to an environment like that and dance with anybody. Hmm. And, and, and one of the things I love about, you know, um, Latin dancing is there's just people from all over the world that, 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 do, that do it. And I've been in, you know, places you know, I was in this place in Miami and we were, it was a similar thing where people from all over the world, they came to this, you know, salsa convention and there was a lot of classes and, you know, about different, you know, kind of techniques and, and salsa, you know, from Cuba versus, you know, some other places. And um, in the evenings they opened up the floor for freestyle. And it's so cool to like dance with someone from Germany, mm -hmm. I don't speak the language or you're dancing with someone from, Nigeria and the next dancer dancing with someone from France and the next dancer dancing with someone from Israel. And, um, you know, that's just an example of something I like, I saw something that I really appreciated. I had, I did not know how to do it. I had my core skills of, you know, movement, um, you know, th through, through my uh, earlier days, but I didn't know how to do that kind of dancing. This was very technical. And so by, you know, learning, making mistakes, and continue just to put myself out there, you know, I got to that level. And uh, that's a good example of what I'm talking about that's non-professional that, um, that I think does, you know, exemplify, exemplify the, the, the lesson. Yeah, I, I also think that there's the, the theme that I see and it, you know, I can trace back in your story from your parents telling you that you could do anything like, you, and this was gender specific when we were having the conversation, but almost like you could do anything you want to do. If you're passionate about it, you want to do it, go do it. And you kind of carried that forward. I mean, we talked about you being at your MBA program and seeing an HR speaker. And you're like, that, I want to do that. And you did. And then you go and watch a salsa competition. That, I want to do that. And you did. And like, the, just that, that, that from a very early on foundationally, it was like, you can do whatever you want. It's obviously requires a lot of hard work, discipline, practice. But don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. And don't talk yourself out of it. Go do it and see yeah. what happens. And it feels like you've carried that through professionally, personally, throughout your, your life and your career, which is kind of cool. It's funny when you say it that way, it just sounds like, hey, you know, but, <laughs> but, but, the, but the life experiences haven't necessarily been that way. I mean, if even I think about my professional experiences, right? I mean, look, I walk in a room, people don't expect me to be there. I, I, you know, I'm in tech, I'm in digital tech. We're not known as an industry that there's a lot of women or a lot of African-American women at sea level senior positions. Um, and so if I think about just all the different set of experiences um, that have led me to where I am, it's not a straight line. You know what I mean? It's, it's disappointments. It's been, um, I, I mean, certainly like, like 
successes that I was like, wow, I didn't even know this could happen. And, and meeting some incredible people who've taught me so many things along the way. And I don't mean necessarily mentors who are more senior, but even some of the people that, that have reported to me have taught me so much. Um, it's been things that didn't happen the way that I thought they were going to happen. Um, it's been misunderstandings and things like, you know, it's just the, it's, it's life. It's just a professional life that looks probably more like a jagged line than it does this, this a straight linear one. Um, so I appreciate your characterization of it, but the experience of it doesn't, feel, hasn't felt quite that way. <laughs> but, I, but I think that's it. It's, it's just like, you know, you're being authentic yourself and you're, you're jumping in and not shying away from discomfort. And there's a lot of the times that doesn't work out, but there's remarkable things that come from that as well. It's kind of the, the trade-off is it doesn't work out all the time. Most of the time it doesn't, but when it does, it's great. And like, it's just cool yeah. to see. I mean, you jumped from, you know, you were in telco because you want to get in telco and then you jumped to Pepsi to do the, the, the HR Academy, moved to Sony, moved to CBS in, in media space. And then you jumped to tech in mm -hmm. Twitter, Microsoft. And then like, you know, the, the companies are huge. Like you just, you, you kind of continue to push outside of your comfort zone, it seems, into new industries to advance, to learn and grow. Was that always the goal was like, I just want to continue to grow and push myself. And that's why you just kept kind of finding areas, jobs, environments that could do that for you. Yeah. I always, you know, I knew I wanted to be a senior executive, but I, I didn't want to be one of those senior executives that were hollow or empty. I wanted to be really good at what I was doing. I wanted to drive impact. And I knew I couldn't do that if I didn't have the skills and the experiences to do it. I didn't have a timeline. Like it's gotta be, I've got to get this level at this by this, you know, in five years, I did not, never, never, never any of that. It was just always about, okay, what do I need to learn now? What do I need to get better at now? Um, and that's really been the driver. I, I do remember, you know, being at Sony, another incredible company. Um, <laughs> we were, this was like 2000, I don't know, what, 12 or so when, um, you know, Sony, like when I grew up, Sony was like the Apple of the day, you know, today, right? Everybody, you had a Sony Walkman. Oh man, you had arrived. Like you were just like the, the it girl, the it guy. And so Sony was, you know, Sony was it. And I still have affinity. I'm like, no, you know, if we're going to buy some electronic TV, I'm like, it's got to be a Sony because there's <laughs> such, there's such high quality products. Um, but, you know, during this time, um, we were getting hit pretty hard by Samsung and by Apple and, you know, we were losing lots of money. This was kind of the, you know, kind of the downward, um, spiral of, of Sony and, and the electronics field. And when I was laying off people, I mean, I was just like every day I'd get up and from like eight to five and laying off people. And it was hard there were nights I wasn't sleeping. You know, some of these people I care deeply about it and working with them. This, uh, this also, so it was probably a little bit earlier than 2012. I think it was closer to when it started, it was like, you know, more in like 2009 and I just, the economy was terrible. Mm. Um, and so you're laying off people, there's no jobs, you know, watching grown men cry in your office and, and, you know, they have like kids. And so it was really, really difficult. And I made that decision then I'm like, you know, it's a lot more fun to be in a growth industry <laughs> than doing this. And that was a conscious decision to say, let, let me get back to growth because I wasn't enjoying the work um, because it was just so emotionally taxing. And a lot of HR folks got out of, that space because it was really hard, you know, mm. really on, on, on folks uh, to have those types of meetings. And so I did consciously say I wanted to get to get into digital tech. And so that's when I decided to go, you know, move back to San Francisco, which is where I'm from. At the time, I was living in San Diego, another beautiful place um, to pursue digital tech. And of course, by this time, Google was a thing. And, you know, um, Twitter and the whole digital tech industry was, was, was really interesting and booming and thriving. So I went to CBS Interactive and that was kind of this cool combination of media, which I had an experience with 
and and technology. I mean, the interactive piece was the dot com piece of CBS, right? It was like CBS.com, CBS Sports.com. And here we were with this like conglomerate, this hugely successful media company, and we're like a four-year-old division, you know, the dot com internet side. <laughs> it was really different. And so that was another interesting challenge is, you know, kind of building up this this interactive division. That's, you know, kind of what led me back, you know, back into this digital tech space. Um, and then, you know, I remember their Twitter was like six years, seven years old, and they were building up HR talent. And and I got a call from somebody in my network that says, hey, would you work for Twitter? They're, they're trying to grow their HR team. And uh, I said, yeah, I talked to them. And I ended up interviewing with the CHRO who had been a PepsiCo alum as well. We were there at the same time. So again, you never know when you're going to, you know, run into these people. And, and so I got hired there and, and it was super cool to be at Twitter at this time where there was like lots of growth and it was super exciting. Everybody was like, what's Twitter? <laughs> I had I didn't have a Twitter account. I had to learn to do a tweet, you know, when I was in my onboarding program. And I remember half the people in there had never done a tweet because we had to raise our hand. But you know, we quickly learned how to get proficient with the, that kind of form of social media, which was still kind of coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, again, the driver for me was, where can I be in a place that's, that's growing, that will challenge me? Um, I hadn't been in a social media company. And so I had to learn the business. Right. Um, and that was exciting. Did you feel comfortable in digital tech when you got it? Because now, since Twitter, you haven't left digital tech. Like that's been your home now, yeah. industry-wise in terms of like, and what was it about there that just keeps you fascinated to stay in this industry? Yeah. Yeah, I think I found my place in digital tech, even though it's hard, it's a hard industry, right? It's challenging, a lots, of, there's so many issues, but I think that may be the driver for me is like, we just don't, have it figured out and um, there's just such opportunity to make impact you know twitter had a great culture this is why it's so hard to see what's happening to twitter now um i just you know met some amazing people there people loved working at twitter um just the culture people just it was just this affinity that people had just this warmness that people had and um you know it's cool to be in hr when people feel that way about the company and 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 really work on the talent space but um yeah, I think the driver for me is just the opportunity to continue to drive impact. Um, and it's still, and it's still, you know, I know there have been lots of layoffs recently, but there's still so many opportunities. The other thing I will say is one of the things about Pepsi, I just remember distinctly as I kind of transitioned out of that. Um, I mean, that's a great company, but for me personally, I wanted to be someplace where I could change the world like mm. you know it wasn't just impact on my role it was impact in what we were doing you know and so uh, that's the other thing that's a draw for technology is because man there's such a huge uh kind of shift that technology companies can can make for the good in our lives um and that's not just digital tech I mean, if you think about technology even 100 years ago it's had probably the most profound impact on on the way that we live and that has been a draw as well. And and I know we're we're you have time for a few more questions. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, at what point did you feel the purpose of the organization was valuable to you in terms of like, and where in your career were you like, I, I really want to work for a company, an industry that's making change in the world versus just your 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 actual role itself growing, but you attaching to the purpose. When did that happen? Yeah. Probably when I left Horizon, because I mm. went to Mexico as in CPG. And, you know, I am really into like health and fitness and, you know, and, and there's definitely an element of health and fitness now, right? But like some of the products just, you know, weren't like things I consumed, on, you know, a lot. So for me personally, um, not as connected, right, to, to kind of the purpose there, even though the company is amazing. Um, then I went to, you know, well, Disney company entertainment, uh, certainly an element of impact there. Right. If you think about entertainment, um, but maybe not in the way that I wanted. And so after those two experiences, I was like, I really want to get back to tech. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, at the time telecom 
was really interesting tech. I worked with tons of engineers, right? And so that's what I had said in my in my mind and my heart. And then, you know, going to Sony was really that kind of combination of technology, CPG, consumer products, and entertainment. So it was a really great, you know, place for me to move out of some of the other industries that I'd been in and then land someplace that actually was a combination of all those three. But that that was, I remember very consciously deciding, I just, you know, what's missing for me? It's not just impact on the role, but I have to feel connected to what we're doing as a company and the mission of the company. And that was even before we were talking about mission and purpose, right, as a thing. Um, and maybe we were all feeling it, but I, that was a very conscious decision back then. And, and, and now being in the, the, the role in the organization you're with now, very purpose-driven in terms of why you wanted to take on this position, where you're at in your career and kind of where the company's at? Yeah, um, I, I have been very intentional around, you know, different organizations that I've gone to with that mission in mind um, because of being off mission. Hmm. That's what kind of led me back to being really intentional about that. Um, and I mean, Microsoft was certainly that for me. Uh, I, I probably did the best work of my career at Microsoft. Just so many opportunities to drive impact there very mission oriented place, very clear on, you know, what Microsoft is, who Microsoft is. Uh, I love, you know, I was kind of there when we had the resurgence or the kind of cultural rebirth of, of the company. It was really cool to be there at a time when we were evolving in such a real way and also leading a global talent management, a global talent management function, which was really a core nucleus of what drove the cultural changes that we were seeing. So it's really cool to be connected with that work when the company was kind of evolving who they were um, in, in, in the world. Um, and then I think that also helped really shape some of my interests now, which, you know, was data. I mean, I love data. I think data is super powerful. And I, I was really intentional in landing in a company that understood the power of data and we're helping customers make better business decisions through, through data. And of course, in my head and my heart, I'm thinking of employee data, mm. you know, and, and right now I'm th I think a lot about how can we help HR leaders become more skilled, more proficient, extract and, visualize data and tell stories through data that drive impact. Cause I just do believe data is very powerful. It's very cool. It's kind of come, you know, you've, you've gone through your career and now you've been in the tech industry and now you want to take almost the learnings from the tech industry and apply it to your craft of HR and kind of yeah, that's you know, right. reshape HR. And it goes back to the first meeting you had of the Bank of America HR professional where you were like, this is cool. I want to do this. And now you want to change it through data, which is, which is kind of cool. I mean, your brother would be so proud that you want to take an engineering <laughs> approach to changing HR. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, maybe so, but uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great way of kind of connecting the dots. Um I think at this point in my career, you know, I, I am, what's really the driver for me, um, when you think about what's the challenge you're trying to go, you know, what mountain are you trying to climb? It, it's really shifted for me of how can I help others be true to themselves through not just who they are, but also just their work and their craft and do the things that bring them joy. And how, how can I be helpful in that process? Um, how can I be helpful in people really getting clear on their why? Because I do think that we do our best work when we're really strongly connected to our why mm -hmm. and that we're living our why in a way that's really authentic to who we are. Um, and it really all comes down to how, how do we help mine this amazing potential that each of us has to drive impact in the world, you know, through, through the lens in which, in, which, in which we see the world. And we all see the world in different ways. And I think that's beautiful. I love that. I love that. And then the last question to wrap up is, 
if there's one thing that you would want people to know about you that they can't pick up off your LinkedIn profile, who would that be? Hmm. One thing. Gosh, we talked about so many. I know. I didn't tell the story earlier, but I'll share it now um, because it's had a huge pro profound impact on me. When I was 16, my dad, who I talked to you about earlier, you know, this big army guy, um, he fought in Korea. He fought twice in Vietnam. Very dedicated to country and family. Awesome dad. 6'5", handsome, could sing, had a beautiful voice, you know, just really smart, like my brother smart. That's where my brother got the smarts from. <laughs> That's my dad, just brilliant guy, you know, had two master's degrees and math and chemistry and just like, just this really amazing human. Um, he got sick and I was in my junior year, 16. And I remember I got a call from my mom saying, Monica, you have to come home from school. You know, we've had to rush dad to the hospital. Um, Literally, my mom dragged him out of our, our family home. He's a big guy uh, to get him in the car because all of his neurological functions were disabled. And so for the next three months, we would go to the hospital and sit with my dad. He was in a coma for that time. He died twice. I would get home from school. I would go to the hospital, like me and my brother and my mom, and we'd sit there to be with them. He, you know, and he was in a coma and they were, you know, and I said he died twice. It was a very traumatic time. And I shared with you how close, you know, I was with my dad. So this was really difficult to process for me as a young person. Um, he would eventually come out of it as a quadriplegic and live for the next 19 years of his life in um, Yachtville Veterans Home. And so when I was in college, I'd drive back and I'd go see my dad. Um, Unfortunately, died of a stroke and, um, you know, we all went to the facility where they had him and said our goodbyes. And, you know, but when I think about the life of my dad and the impact that he made, and look, we all have people in our lives, many people in our lives that had, that made an impact. Um, and I talked about my mom, right? She's one of those, but, but I'll share the story about my dad because like during that time, you'd think, gosh, what an unfortunate thing to happen to a young person. Because I lost my dad, you know, when I was 16, but I lost my mom too, because she was trying to take care of him. She was trying to make everything work. And um, there was a time, you know, we were like, would we sell the house? Like, you know, what do we do? Because she was, she was trying to, she was fighting with the VA. She was trying to, you know, Clearly there were chemicals used in Vietnam linked to his condition and she had to prove that case. It took her four years and she, she eventually did. But during that four years, that time, we financially were struggling. There wasn't money for college. Like she had used all that up and, and uh, it, it was just this really tenuous time. And so, but I think of the lessons that I learned from that. And they, these are probably the lessons that have had the biggest impact on me. I had to be independent because I didn't have a mom. I didn't have a dad. I mean, I had obviously both, but they were not, could not really spend any time with me or focus on, you know, what I was doing. You know, I, I, I applied to one school, <laughs> UC Santa Barbara. I got in, right? But like, who does that? Like, that probably wasn't very smart. Um, but I was just doing a lot of stuff on my own. But the, I'd say the lessons that taught me were you know, man, it was a sense of independence. I had to, I had to pull out of myself whatever I needed. And it was, and it was kind of surprising, like how much we do have that we, you know, maybe we think somebody has to help us with, or, you know, but when you're in a situation where the Calvary isn't coming, mm -hmm. you know, th there are some things that you, 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 you just do and you do them, maybe you do them fearful, but you do them because you're, you're empowering yourself, right? And I think that lesson I learned very early on, that was also a time where I really developed my faith too. I, I really believe that 
I, you know, like I can't control everything. And some stuff you just have to let go and do what you can. Um, I also feel that there were people that came into my life at that time that were there. They were just sent to help me. Uh, and some of those friends I met in college, they're still friends today, but like I can't imagine having gone through experience I had without them. Um, their sense of determination that also came as a result of that experience. Um, because my parents had always taught me, you're going to college. But like, there was no, there's no one to help me get there, right? I had to figure that out myself. And, you know, look, there's tons of people who have to do that. And maybe their circumstances are different. But through that, ex those, that experience with my dad, it just, um, it shaped so much of, you know, who I am and what I need to be a good mom, <laughs> to be effective in this industry, um, to be a good wife and all the things. Cause look, we all deal, life happens to all of us and we ha have a number of challenges we all have to deal with. Um, but sometimes those, those things that happen in our lives that we wish had gone another way are the best teachers to, to, to help us realize the power that we already have within ourselves. So. Jeez. That's a, yeah, that's a remarkable story. Um, I'm, I'm a, a relatively new dad, so it, 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 it hits me pretty, yeah. pretty hard, but thank you for sharing that with me. I mean, that's a, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's heavy. That's very heavy. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share it. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you liked today's story. And if you want to hear more great stories, make sure to follow Spark Recruiting on YouTube and LinkedIn to stay up to date on our upcoming episodes. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.